rebelled, and some even cried out for a return to monarchy and for General George Washington to be crowned King of America. But the man who had led an army of farmers to victory over the mighty British Empire made it clear that the only title he desired was citizen of the United States of America. I am at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an idea which to me seems the greatest mischief that can befall our country. If you have any regard for yourself, banish these thoughts from your mind. But when the new nation finally adopted its constitution, and it came time to elect its first president, there were no doubts about who that president should be. Only he had such doubts. I fear my countrymen will expect too much of me. I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. In the end, Washington set the most important precedent of all. The man who could have been king stepped down after two terms in office and took his place again amongst the people. By insisting that he was, above all other things, one of us, he made it possible for any of us to dream of serving the nation in its highest office. And one day, sure enough, it came to pass that a man who wasn't an aristocrat aspired to the office of president. Andrew Jackson was a battle-forged frontiersman, and according to his predecessor, President John Quincy Adams, a barbarian who cannot write a sentence of grammar and can hardly spell his own name. To which Jackson merely replied, It's a damn poor mind indeed. You can't think of at least two ways to spell a word. <laughs> he may have lacked a formal education, but he was tough and brilliant. Just the ticket for a new nation of Americans struggling to turn a dream into an enduring reality. They swept Jackson into office by a landslide, and then descended on his inauguration determined to shake his hand in person. Why, 20,000 country people shove to get in the door and no. track their muddy boots across the carpet. And my dear, they would be here still if we hadn't placed tubs of punch out on the lawn. Washington's elite fumed, but Jackson loved it, for these were his people. He was proud to be one of us. I do not forget that the planter, the farmer, the mechanic and the laborer form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of this country. But Andrew Jackson would wage a mighty struggle to hold that great body of people together. State by state, a monstrous injustice that had haunted the country since its beginning was now tearing it apart. Civil War threatened, we searched deep in our heartland for a leader equal to the ordeal ahead. It was perhaps a vindication of the American dream that we found a plain spoken, self taught lawyer from Illinois whose campaign platform could be summed up in five simple words All men are created equal. I say this government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln's words touched the hearts of reasonable men. And in 1860, we sent him to Washington, where he would face the hardest task that any American president would ever face. I know there is a God, and that he hates injustice and slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. If he has a place, work for me. And I think he has. I believe I'm ready. I am nothing. But truth is everything. And with God's help,
cannon spoke for war. Bitter, violent, and devastating. The blood of half a million Americans was shed in the dark days of our Civil War. But as the sun rose on a cold November day in 1863, thousands of Americans gathered on the battlefield in Gettysburg to hear President Abraham Lincoln give meaning to our sacrifice. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. did have a new birth of freedom, and as our frontiers pushed west, we looked for new leaders that embodied our goals and new spirit. Leaders like Theodore Roosevelt, born to wealth and privilege, but imbued with the spirit of the American frontier. He rode with cowboys and led his rough riders up San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. This kind-hearted, tough guy fought against monopolies, and for the working class. We called him Teddy. Anything else would have been far too formal. He even refused to call his official residence the executive mansion. To him, it was just a house. It was just a white house. And so, it would always be called. Three decades later, his distant cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt would occupy that same White House and lead the country through its hardest trials since the Civil War. A world war was looming, and the Great Depression had paralyzed great nations. The president we called upon to lead us through those hard times was himself paralyzed by polio. But with determined optimism, he had triumphed. And now he was ready to share his cheerful strength with a badly frightened people. During FDR's fireside chats on the radio, entire cities came to a standstill and listened to the people themselves. Let us unite in banishing fear. Together, we cannot fail. In a calm and reassuring voice, he called out to America. 
and America answered back. We're just modest, middle-class people having lost the little we have. My savings are tied up in a closed bag. I believe that you will guide us through your Protect us from that conflict in Europe, dear President. And I expect to be in service shortly. Now we know we are not fighting alone. I feel that at last we can hope. With that hope, we began to believe in the future again. FDR had reminded us of the power of the American dream. Sixteen years later, America's youngest elected president once again called upon the power of the people to change the world. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. John F. Kennedy's stirring words ushered in a historic decade of civic activism in which ordinary Americans struggled to right old wrongs and chart new frontiers of possibility. It has always been the role of presidents to remind us of our roots, to call us to the future. In their best moments, they speak words that are already there in our hearts, especially in times of tragedy. All I have, I would have given the letter not to be standing here today. We mourn seven heroes. We mourn their loss as a nation together. You have lost too much, but you have certainly not lost America, or we will stand with you.
Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard M. Nixon, Gerald R. Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. And now we come to the present, a present that is rooted in our past. For all of Liberty's leaders have one thing in common, one trust they all accepted. My fellow citizens, no event could have filled me with greater anxiety than that notification on the 14th day of April, 1789, that you had selected me to lead our nation. But it was with the confidence of my fellow citizens that I took an oath, 35 simple words that have been repeated by every American president throughout history. As long as that oath is taken and solemnly fulfilled, the American dream will endure. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, President Barack Obama. The American dream is as old as our founding, but as timeless as our hopes. It is reborn every day in the heart of every child who wakes up in a land of limitless possibilities, in a country where we the people means all the people. We may come from different places and believe in different things, but what makes us American is a shared spirit, a spirit of courage and determination, of kindness and generosity. It is a spirit grounded in the wisdom of the generations that have gone before us but open to the unimagined discoveries and possibilities on the horizon that lies ahead. Let us enjoy it, cherish it, defend it, and pass it on to our children as the bright and beautiful blessing it is, this enduring American dream.